Let us turn again to Galatians chapter 2. We'll read again verses 11 through the end of the chapter. Let us hear God's word. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We, who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I... Through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and fallible word. I'd like to also remind us again of the uh, answer to Lord's Day 1, question and answer 1, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And we find that answer, that I with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood, has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Thus far, Lord's Day 1, or question 1, or, and answer 1, Bar Heidelberg Catechism. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we continue our sermon from this morning, Life in Christ, we saw this morning that being united to Christ, we are incorporated into his work, connected to his work, and that work then is on our behalf, but is actually given to us as if we had done it ourselves. So we are crucified with Christ, which also means that we're buried with Christ and all of our sins are buried with him. But based on his resurrection, we also know that we are united to Christ in his life and also his righteousness. And so we recognize that being crucified with Christ isn't the end of the story, nor is it for Paul, nor is it in our confession in Lord's Day 1. But being united to Christ brings us into a relationship with the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And our catechism does draw attention to the fact that being united to Christ also grants unto us the blessings of having a faithful Heavenly Father. 
and His Holy Spirit who He sends to assure us of eternal life and make us willing and ready to serve Him. And we find that implied also in Paul's confession here in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, all of that implies also that the Father has given his Son to be a Savior of sinners, and also that he's given his Holy Spirit to grant unto us life and to live out of Christ. But they're all connected to Christ. Even our catechism points that out very clearly, that we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, and he preserves me so that without the will of my heavenly Father. But it's, it's Christ who's preserving us along with the Father. And it's therefore by his Holy Spirit, he, namely Christ, assures me of eternal life and makes me willing and ready. But that work is also through the Holy Spirit. And, and so Christ is the focus of it all. And a life in Christ brings us into the family of God United to the Father and the Holy Spirit, not only Christ, but also the Father and the Spirit. And so what we recognize is a life in Christ is, is to live out of him in all aspects of life. And as we live out of him, we can be assured of his, first of all, his preserving grace. Secondly, his assuring grace. And thirdly, his equipping grace. First of all, then, living out of Christ's preserving grace. We are reminded that Paul's confession was, I have been crucified with Christ. That, that tense of the word, especially in Greek, that past perfect tense, it's, it's, it's already happened. And it continues to be true. And it will continue to be true. And that's why we recognize that continued blessing of knowing that we are crucified with Christ. That's why he says in, in Romans chapter 6 that we can reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive in God in Christ Jesus because it's based on His resurrection and His Holy Spirit. Many times in the Scriptures when it talks about the Gospel being about Christ crucified, that's, that's not necessarily saying that's only the Gospel in Christ crucified, but, but the Gospel contains all of the work of Christ. And indeed, the gospel hinges both on the crucifixion and the resurrection. And based on his resurrection and his, his ascension into heaven, seated at the right hand of God, he so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not even a hair will fall in, uh, from my head. And he's working all things in my life to the service of my salvation. What a powerful truth to meditate upon. That we are preserved through Christ by our Father in heaven. And indeed, we recognize that that applies to our physical life. His physical care for us as His creature. He is the Creator. He is the provider. Colossians 1 is very clear about that. Christ is instrumental in creation. It's the word. And, and he provides and he upholds all things. And so we recognize that, that even as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are involved in creation, so Christ also preserves us in his fatherly care. And he guides all things. Just think about that. The very hairs on your head are numbered. Some of us can count them a little easier than others, but God knows every single person's hair 
on every single person's head. And he so cares for us and he preserves us. Think of the psalm we just sang in the beginning of our service from Psalm 91, Psalter 248. How there we find our abode in the wings of the Almighty God, in Christ. There we find our refuge. There we find our safety under His protecting care. What do we sing? He shall save thee from the hidden snare. When fearful plagues around prevail, thy life the scourge shall not assail. His faithfulness shall ever be a sure protection unto thee. That's being preserved, yes, physically by Christ. But, but really that's not necessarily all that's encompassing about the preservation of Christ. He especially preserves us in the very grace that he's given to us through his work. He preserves us, in other words, in his salvation. He preserves us as adopted children of God who have been brought into fellowship with the family of God. And we recognize that just because God preserves us through Christ does not mean we will never have physical afflictions. It does not mean we will never have spiritual afflictions. It will not mean we don't ever have interpersonal challenges and everything else in life. All of the brokenness of life are manifest also in a Christian. And yet, we can be assured and know that Christ is so preserving us that he even takes all of the challenges of life and he uses them for our salvation. I don't know what challenge you're facing today. Or will face tomorrow. But I can assure you that in the midst of challenges, God is at work using them by his providence. And through his care for you. And when, he, and when you don't know where to turn. You can know that God hears the needy when they cry and he answers them in his grace and he preserves them through it. You can look to me as a pastor. I, I will fail you. You can look to your parents. They will fail you. You can look to your elders. They will fail you. But God is using all these things to serve for your salvation. Our family just has been reading through the account and, of Joseph and how he was sold into slavery in Egypt. And there, God so provides that Joseph would rise to the second highest level in all of Egypt and really all of the world because all of the world was dependent upon the food that was in Egypt. And there Joseph meets again with his brothers. You can imagine that meeting when Joseph had to tell them, you meant all of this for evil to me, but God meant it for your good and for my good and the world's good. We can know that God is in absolute control of all things. When you look at the life of Daniel and of Jonah, which you're studying in men's fellowship, and to see that even in all the brokenness, that God has his redeeming work in mind. He is the one who preserves us. And he's the one who preserves us in the midst of all of our trials and all of our challenges, whatever they might be. And again, I don't know what they're going to be in your life. I don't know. I can't tell you, young people, that you will not be persecuted for your faith. I look around the world today and I, I just see even in North America here in the past couple days, a sudden 
rampant turn to anti-Semitism even by many, some leaders even. And, and the, the protest, it, it's alarming how quickly things can change. I don't know what Christians will face next week, next month, next year, next decade. I can't promise you peace on earth. I can't promise you that you won't face poverty. I can't promise you that you will have health the rest of your life. You may be faced with, with cancer, maybe at, a, at, at the age of 20, at the age of 30, 40, 50. I, I know people in all of these age groups that's faced serious illness and died from serious illness or in accidents. I don't know what God has in store for you or for me. But I can tell you, I can tell you that we have the preserving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ when we put our trust in Him. And that is my comfort in life and in death, that I belong to Him and that I'm an heir with Christ in God, in the family of God. And now what Paul writes in Romans 8, that if we are children of God, then we are heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We have an inheritance that's incorruptible. We have an inheritance that will never perish. And we are preserved in Christ for that inheritance. And if it be, says Paul, if it be that we suffer with Him, then we also may know that we will be glorified together in Christ, preserved in Him. He says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Because He delivers us, as He writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 1, he delivered us from such a great death. And He does deliver us. And then He goes on to say, in whom we trust that He will still deliver us. Because we are preserved all the way through unto eternal life. And that's why Paul could write to the Romans in Romans 8. He knows that all things work together. The good things, the bad things. They all work together for good. To them that love God. To those whom he has called according to his purpose. As those whom he has foreknew. And those whom he has justified. He will also glorify. And sometimes we can't fully comprehend this. And these glorious truths. But we need a faithful father who's given his son to preserve us even to the end. We are not our own as Christians, but we belong to him. And if we belong to him, Jesus himself says, we belong to the father and the son because he and the father are one. In John 10, he even says, that is so secure, so absolutely secure. That eternal life that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, that it is impossible that anyone can snatch us from the hand of our Heavenly Father. No one can pry those fingers apart, not even Satan himself, can pry those fingers apart that we would be taken from the Father's hand. What shall we say to these things? Paul says, I am persuaded, absolutely persuaded, that neither life nor death nor principalities nor power nor depths or heights or anything, nothing will ever separate me from the love of God, 
which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Is there a more blessed comfort in the midst of challenges and afflictions? And being so persuaded, we have the assuring grace of Christ. And we live out of it. We live out of it. That's what we see secondly, living out of Christ's assuring grace. Paul was certainly very confident and assured that he belonged to Christ. It even says in verse 19 that I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. He was assured of this life this life that was to be lived to God because he was crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. We can be assured of God's grace and eternal life through the Holy Spirit. How does that work? Sometimes we, <clears throat> as Christians, and sometimes, sometimes people say, well, people and Christians, especially in free reformed circles or, or even other conservative reformed circles, that sometimes as, they struggle with assurance more than others. <clears throat> and and I, I, would, I would say that may be true in some senses, but, but many Christians do struggle with assurance. And so it's good that we all understand how the Holy Spirit assures us of our life in Christ. Because the Holy Spirit does not want us to go around doubting and wondering whether we truly know the grace of God in Jesus Christ. He wants us to know it. He wants us to have a ready defense for it. He wants us to be able to articulate it and encourage others with it. And so we need to know indeed that God's grace and eternal life that comes through the Holy Spirit is mine. How do I know that? Well, the first way is through the promises of God's Word. Are you willing to say that God's a liar? If you aren't, then hear His promises. All who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall have eternal life. Does it sound like God's not serious about this? That he, that he might give it? No. He says conclusively, when you believe on me, you have eternal life. He's not alive. His promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. He has suffered. He has died to confirm those promises through his resurrection. And his word comes to us and his promises are absolutely sure. And we can know that, that, that his promises are sure and that when we believe in him and we trust in his promises, then those promises are sure. That's the object of truths that are set before us. God cannot lie. And his promises are sure. If that is not the foundation of our assurance of faith, then we will never have solid assurance. But there is also, and you can think about this in the way of a pyramid, if the promises are the foundation and the base, then you could say the second tier, which is a narrower tier then in the pyramid, would be what we call the, the marks of grace or the reflex acts of grace that, that God has given to us. So when we are alive in Christ, that's going to change our life. It's going to change our desires. And by the grace of God, we're going to, we're going to be able 
and begin to love like we never did love before. We're going to hate sin like we never hated sin before. We're going to want to live for him like we never lived for him before. And when you see these even small marks of grace, you can only give thanks to God for them because they're all gifts from God. They're not produced by you, but they're produced by the Spirit who lives in you. Christ living in you by His Spirit, is, uh, He's producing these works. And so, so you can be assured that, that indeed, if Christ is doing these things in my life, yes, I must conclude, indeed, that I'm united to Him and assured of His grace. And then there's a final one. It's called the direct testimony of the Holy Spirit. And you see that at, at the top. And that's very clearly taking God's word, understanding it and receiving it and believing it. For example, Romans 8. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, we read in verse 15, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself is bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so when we come to understand the promises of our Heavenly Father in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, and when we see God working in us and we cry out to him, Abba, Father, we can only conclude then that the Spirit is testifying with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's an amazing testimony of God Himself that we can be assured that we are united to Christ. But not every day that we feel that kind of testimony, maybe, in our lives. So what happens when you turn the pyramid upside down? And you're waiting for that direct testimony that comes from God without the promises and without the marks of grace, and you're just waiting to hear that message that you are a child of God, then some days you'll feel like it and not. And that's not a very stable assurance, is it? To have a pyramid on its, on its point. But when you flip it around and you begin with the promises of God, and we come to understand them by the Spirit living within us, and we come, begin to live them out by the Spirit living within us, then we can conclude indeed that we are the children of God. Sometimes we complicate assurance of faith. But in order to enjoy that assurance of faith, we need to stop and we need to not reflect so much on ourselves. Yes, we do need to know ourselves and our misery and so on. We understand that. We look at ourselves and we find ourselves sinners. But to, to meditate on that and to stay there is hopeless. But when we look outside of ourselves to God and we look at his character... And we know him, yes, as a just God and a holy God, but also a God who is merciful, who delights in mercy, who does not desire the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn and repent and believe in him. When we understand the character of our God is a patient God, a God who loves and cherishes his people, And we meditate upon the very character of God and we come to understand then why he's given his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we begin to meditate upon Jesus himself and what he's done for us. How he's come to suffer and to die for us. He lived a perfect, obedient life for us as we heard this morning. And that in him we have life. And we meditate upon what Christ is continuing to do then in our lives. As we see his spirit working in us to conform us to his very image. Through the transformation of our minds. This is what God is doing. And then the marks of grace, they begin to follow. 
And we give God all of the praise and all of the glory because of the evidence of Christ working in us. We can enjoy then this blessed assurance that Jesus is mine and I belong body and soul and life and death to him. But you can't enjoy the assurance of God if you're looking at the law and you're looking at your own sinfulness and you're looking at all of your brokenness. You will never enjoy the assurance that there is in Christ Jesus. That's why so many of our forms, whether it be for baptism or Lord's Supper, we, we look outside of ourselves to Jesus Christ. That's where we find life. That's where we find assurance. That's how we can live out of His assuring grace. But finally, we also live out of his equipping grace. Living out of his equipping grace. For I, says Paul, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. It's no longer I who live, he says, but Christ living in me. And that life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. The only life, says Paul, that I live is a life in Christ where daily I deny myself and daily I take up my cross and follow him. And as I do so, he equips me. Everything, he says, all of my life, everything I do, everything I've ever done, all the credit goes to Christ. It's he who lives in me. That's the only life I have. There is nothing in myself. Absolutely nothing. Every single blessing to the church whether it's apostles whether it's elders and deacons or pastors or missionaries or parents or school teachers every single one of them who's been a blessing in your life and in my life they didn't find that strength and that equipping in themselves it could only come through the life that Christ lives as Christ lives within them. He is the one who equips. And he even gives all of the, the equipping and the tools and the armor, even as we find in Ephesians 6. As we are called then, as Christians, into this holy warfare, to now be willing and ready to serve him. And he calls us to take upon ourselves the armor of God. If you have your Bibles open to Ephesians 6. There in verse 14, after he tells us about who we are all fighting, the principalities and the powers and, and, and how we need to stand in, in faith in the Lord. He says, standing therefore in verse 14, having girded your waist with what? Truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which, which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. 
and, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Just so stop there a moment. Look at each one of them. Each one of them, in one way or another, focuses back on the very Word of God. The truth that's contained in the Word of God. The gospel of peace that's contained in the Word of God. That sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Without the Word of God, there's no equipping. And God has so graciously given us His Word. That Word that assures us through the promises. That Word that motivates us through the work of Christ set forth in it. And motivates us to be willing and ready to serve Him. That Word that instructs us. Now, if you're going to if you're going to put on all of these things, the, 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 the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the gospel of peace and the shield of faith and, and, and the, the, sword of, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, you're going to need some instruction in how to use them. And God gives us instruction in His Word of what faith is, what faith looks like, and how it quenches the fiery darts of the wicked one. I would tell Satan, you have no business here because Christ has, has defeated you. That word has power. Power to motivate us. Power to instruct us. Power to conform us. That's God's equipping grace. But you also need to know the discipline and the training that goes along with this armor and continue to be engaged in it. Putting truth around your waist. Knowing the truths of God in Christ Jesus. Knowing that the breastplate of righteousness is not necessarily my righteousness, but Christ's righteousness that's given to me. But also that righteousness that produces a right living within me. Having, having our feet shod with the gospel of peace, ready to run to bring the good news, trained, equipped to bring that good news to the ends of the world. Trained in how to use the shield of faith. Trained in how to, how to, how to make sure that the helmet of salvation is protecting you and, and that the sword of the Spirit is effective. That's what we need to be trained in. Discipline. It takes discipline through His Word. And, and then the final, the final equipping, He gives us prayer. In Ephesians, 5, Ephesians 6, verse 18, He says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. The greatest of all weapons that God equips us with is prayer. Is prayer. And when you don't know where to turn in the midst of your challenges, in the midst of your afflictions, and you begin to doubt God's preserving grace, how could these things be? And you lose sight of those promises of God that we are heirs with Christ, joint heirs with Christ. And you lose pro sight of these promises. And you're in a hopeless situation. And you bend your knees in prayer. And you don't know what to pray. Romans 8. Paul says, even as the whole creation groans and birth pangs till now, so the Holy Spirit groans for those who submit to the will of their Father in heaven. And don't know where to turn today. Because he's equipped them with prayer. Even though it doesn't have words. What a comfort. He's equipping his people. And yes, when we look around the church... It's messy. When we look around in this world and we see the church in all of its brokenness, 
all of its challenges. We can absolutely know that God is raising up a generation to serve him. A generation of Christians who are united to him, who belong to him. Young people, hear me. He's raising up you as that generation to equip you to serve in your families, in your church, and in society. To prepare you for the challenges that await you because you belong to him when you trust in him. You belong to him body and in soul and life and in death. As we read in Psalm 110, as Christ is at the right hand of God and he's putting all things under his footstool. Then we know that he's in the business of making willing volunteers in the day of his power. He's raising up an army of Christians, the next generation. Do you believe that? Isn't that what you confess in Lord's Day 1? That I belong to my faithful Savior and through his Holy Spirit, he's making me willing and ready to serve him. To be willing volunteers in the day of his power. He's equipping me. He's equipping the person sitting next to me. Are we living out of Christ? I hope no one here can say that they cannot answer Lord's Day 1 as we confess it in our Heidelberg Catechism. But maybe you can't. And if you can't, I want to urge you with the last verse of this, of this chapter in Galatians 2. Do not, do not set aside the grace of God Do not count it as something that's worthless and useless. Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God. I'm not going to turn and direct you to works and works righteousness, no. But I'm not going to direct you to fatalism either. But I'm going to direct you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's in Him that you can live and die happily. And there's no one else that can do that for you and for me. No one else can give you that comfort in life and in death. And so I set before you Jesus. I set before you his grace. You say, how do I know that his grace is enough? He says his grace is super abounding. Super abounding. There's enough grace for the greatest of sinners. If there is enough grace for Paul, a persecutor of the church, there's enough grace for you and for me. Amen.
Let's pray. Lord, we stammer a few words about who you are, what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do. We've heard of the glory of your Son. We've heard of your glory, O Lord Jesus. We have heard of your work, O Holy Spirit. We plead with you to take that word and penetrate our hearts and our lives that we would be conformed to the very image of Jesus Christ we would find our life in him and that we would live out of him today and forever. For we pray it in his precious name. Amen.